I'm Dr. Kelly. I don't know if I've met everybody here. A few familiar faces, but we're going over asthma and allergies tonight. Um, I guess that's him. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a suffering. Okay. So this concerned me as a mother because I obviously want to know what are the major health challenges for children in our country. So nearly one in three children are affected by one of these four conditions, asthma, allergies, autism, or ADHD. That's huge. That is a lot of children in our country affected by one of these four. That's 20 million children, actually. So it's like, wait a second, what's going on here? Why are all these, why are all these on the rise, and what's going on in our environment, or our genes to cause these? So um, things like this interest me as a mother. And, um, I mean, as a doctor for my patients, like, what, what can we do to help these conditions naturally? So, typically, if you are diagnosed with asthma or you have seasonal allergies or food allergies or anything like that, you're going to get a beta-2 antagonist inhaler. Those are used for, um, like, your asthma attack. You're going to get the beta-2 antagonist inhaler to basically open up the bronchial so you can breathe. And you're going to have corticosteroids uh, prescribed, inhaled or intranasal, antihistamines, decongestants, topical steroid creams for skin reactions, and like I said, for asthmatics, um, you typically have an emergency inhaler for when you're in the middle of an asthma attack, you can't breathe, you grab your emergency inhaler so you'll open up all your bronchioles and you'll be able to breathe. Inhaled corticosteroids are for chronic asthma, they decrease inflammatory cells and cause smooth muscle relaxation. <coughs> so those are used more so on a daily basis to prevent asthma attacks. Uh, like I said, the other ones are used for emergency diagnosis. So like any drugs, these come with consequences. Glucocorticoids, which is the type of corticosteroids, are um, actually immunosuppressants. There's a ton of um, bad side effects to use them long term. I'm not going to stand here and tell you if you're asthmatic to not use your rescue inhaler because that's just, that's not smart. So if you are asthmatic, my goal is not to tell you not to use your rescue inhaler, but let's try to decrease the amount of times you need to use your rescue inhaler, if that makes sense. So these are all of the um, effects of long term topical steroid use or um, inhaled steroid use, and they're all listed here. And if you use um, topical steroid cream regularly, a lot of people I come into contact with, their kids have eczema. And they don't know it, so they just, they don't know much better, so they just, they use the creams their doctor prescribes. And they use them on a regular basis. And these creams have horrible, horrible side effects where you can become addicted to them and you can actually get what's called red skin syndrome. And it's really, really sad for these kids that are just horribly addicted to the topical steroid creams, and it's not helping their eczema either. And so it's just a vicious cycle. So it's good to avoid these things so we can you know, look for more natural, natural ways to treat. Asthma is, so we're gonna go over, I forgot to mention, we're doing part one of a four, two part series. So we're gonna go over asthma and allergies tonight, and then our next series, we're gonna go over autism and ADHD. <coughs> So tonight uh, we're going to go over asthma and then allergies. Asthma is first. Asthma, 17.7 billion adults have asthma, which is 7.4%, and 6.3 million children currently have asthma, which is 8.6%. It is a disease of diffuse airway inflammation caused by a variety of st triggering stimuli resulting in partially or completely reversible um, bronchoconstriction. So you have two types, extrinsic or intrinsic. Extrinsic is when the allergy or the irritant is on the outside, and intrinsic is when it's on the inside. Does anybody have asthma if they want to share? Okay. You do have to share. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. get to listen to you. So, um, definitely lots of people that have this. And signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms include dyspnea, which is trouble breathing, chest tightness, cough, and wheezing. <clears throat> For asthmatics, they can actually breathe in with no problem, but it's getting the air out that's the issue. So if you can't get all the air out, then you're in a really uh, tough situation. So it's very scary, I imagine. So the, um, the prevalence has actually increased continuously since the 1970s, and it has increased by 300% over the last 20 years. 
It now affects an estimated 235 million people worldwide, and deaths have increased by 56%. Like I said, because it can be fatal, I would never recommend to not use your rescue inhaler. That's it's not good. All right, so the pathophysiology. Inflammation has a central role in the pathophysiology of asthma. You can see right here is the normal bronchial, and the bronchial is the little pathways in your lungs. And then you have an asthmatic bronchial, which you can see all of the edema and the muscle. And then you can see, in addition to that, you have all of the mucus. And so that makes it even harder to breathe as an asthmatic. So you have bronchoconstriction, airway edema, airway hyperresponsiveness, and airway remodeling. So why has asthma uh, increased? That was my biggest question when I wanted to do this workshop. Why are we seeing these things on the rise? And what's in our environment that's causing these things to go up? There's obviously no one thing that we can pinpoint. And there's no solid evidence to pinpoint any of these things. But these are kind of speculations that I found in my research. The first one, obviously, being environmental toxin exposure. So we'll go over those in a little more detail in a minute. But that's just things in our environment that are toxic, toxic to us. Secondhand smoking, which are um, obviously, if you're a child, you can't help but your parents smoke you around it, and it's going to increase your chance for asthma. Prenatal smoking, that's if you're pregnant and smoking, your baby has a, a way higher chance for asthma because of your smoking. You have a um, decreased ability to detoxify in the body will increase your chance of asthma and allergies. And early Tylenol use, I found a study that showed that Tylenol use in small infants increased their chances for asthma. Uh, found a study about C-section saying that if you were delivered by C-section and if you um, been with uh, an emergency C-section, you had an increased chance for asthma. And these other things, systemic connective tissue disorders, juvenile arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and immune deficiencies, and leukemia. Mm -hmm. I found one study, Kemp, um, proposed that childhood vaccines were um, a cause or maybe a link to why asthma and allergies are on the rise. And then uh, found a study that said obesity increases your risk of asthma. Any questions? Keep going. These are the environmental toxins I mentioned. You have pesticides, phthalates, heavy metal exposure, diesel exhaust particles, particulate matter, and mold. And these are just things that are we can not really help you know as much as we would like, but these are things that we're breathing in tiny little particles. And then, especially for pesticides, you think of the food <coughs> that we eat, you know, if it has pesticides. But not only are we eating food with pesticides, but Somebody's in the farm, feed, uh, you know, planting these seeds and spraying the pesticides. And for all those people that are out there, they're having a way high increased risk of asthma because they bring it in and they're spraying it, and then they take it home to their families. Allergies are next. We're going to go over brief, briefly allergies. Allergies are an overreaction of the immune system. So when you have an allergy, you're actually, your, your body is overreacting to something that most people are, some people wouldn't react to, like grass or pollen. Your, your immune system is attacking it in full force. There are four types of hypersensitivity reactions in the body, and these include other things that we'll briefly go over, but um, type 1 is where asthma and allergies fall under. Hay fever is present in about 20% of the Western population, and that's like when you have uh, or, uh, allergy to pollen and dust and stuff like that. It causes hay fever, and you'll have the itchy, watery eyes and the runny nose, stuff like that. And then you have your my little chart here with um, the prevalence of children 0 to, 8, 0 to 17 with a reported allergic condition in the past 12 months by age group. And you can see as the um, Children got older, their, their respiratory allergy was higher. The younger kids were more at risk for food allergy. So, like I said, allergies and asthma are a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction in the body. Not to get too uh, scientific, but this is a category that includes eczema and asthma, and it's caused by an outside allergen. This is the reaction of the body, and that's the um, shows the little cell there. The, um, the main 
a component of a type 1 sensitivity reaction is histamine. And so that's why you have people take antihistamines because this <coughs> chain of events leads to the release of histamine. So you have the allergen, which leads to the CD4 and the um, TH2 cells, they release cytokines, and then the IgE production recruits the eosinophils, which neutralize extra histamine. But the immune complex that's main on the surface of the mast cell is what releases the histamine. So that's why people will take Benadryl and all of that to help dissolve all the histamine. All right, and this can cause systemic anaphylaxis. Does anybody know what that means? Have you ever heard of anaphylactic shock? So you have energy, you can actually have anaphylactic shock. You can, you can also have these things systemically, which means all over your body. You can have itching, hives, bronchospasms, pharyngeal edema, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, vomiting, vascular shock, um, sudden dilation of all the vessels. And histamine, like I said, is a major effector substance, substance in allergic reactions. And it can also cause an increased production of medias in your body. And then you can have local reactions. You can have things like hives or allergic rhinitis, like we talked about, and all the multi that are up there. So you can have a local reaction, like I have a boxer, and when I touch her, I'm not allergic to her, like I don't get rhinitis, but she gives me hives. She's her first touch, and her gives me hives. So you can have local reactions like that. <coughs> so type 2, I'm going to go over these briefly because they are more like an autoimmune type category. Type 2 is broken down into three different categories you can see here underlined. But they are, um, they include things like the RH in pregnancy, if you've heard of that, if you've got a baby with RH and all of that. They include things like that, this category does. And certain drug reactions and transfusion reactions if you get the wrong kind of blood. That's the, that's the reaction that's going on in your body. And then you have type 3, immune complex mediated type. So these immune complexes form and deposit into tissues all over your body. Small vessels, kidneys, joints, heart, cerebral surfaces. And because of these immune complexes that deposit into these tissues, you have fluid accumulation. accumulation. So that's going to include things like rheumatoid arthritis. So type 3 is things like um, autoimmune, rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, farmer's lawn, things like that. So it's not necessarily an allergy, but it's a hypersensitivity of the immune system and overreaction. And then you have type 4, which is delay type. This um, includes the, the tests they do for tuberculosis. So they prick your skin and then like later on you're waiting and waiting for the reaction. This is a type 4 cell mediated reaction. And then you can also have, um, if you have a graft rejection, this is what's going on. All right, and then we have food allergies. Uh, an estimated 9 million or 4% of adults have food allergies. Anybody have food allergies? So four out of every 100 children have a food allergy, which is nearly 6 million. From 1997 to 2007, the prevalence of reported food allergy increased 18% among children under 18 years. So I just have a little graphic here. It says every three minutes a food allergy reaction sends someone to the ER. They're very serious and some of them can be anaphylactic and sending the anaphylactic shock for you to even if you all right, so you have the big eight are the most common, the big eight plus sesame are the most common food, food allergies that you see. Peanuts, tree nuts, crustaceans, cow's milk, hen's eggs, hen's eggs, uh, fish, soy, meat, and sesame. Cow's milk allergy is the most common food allergy in infants. That's why you have so many babies that have a hard time with formula, because it is, it is a very common allergy in babies. And peanut allergy is the most common cause of food-related death. I know in the schools here, they're strict about peanuts, and this is why, because somebody's peanut butter sandwich could be dead for the next kid over. So you have to be very careful with these severe allergies. All right, and you have um, the skin. It's mostly targeted when you have food allergies, and it says over 80% of allergic reactions to foods are um, targeting the skin. 
so you can have hives and swelling. I know y'all seen that movie. What is it? He his he eats something and his face swells up. It's Will Smith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like his foot starts to mangus. That's um, angioedema. So next time you watch that, you can think of angioedema. That's rapid swelling of your dermis. So you can have the hives and the uh, angioedema. And those are the most common skin manifestations of food hypersensitivity reactions. And they usually, if it's an allergy, it usually is going to appear pretty soon after eating the food. I know um, there's, a big, there's a difference between an allergy and an intolerance. So an allergy is going to be pretty immediate. Like if you eat a peanut, you're going to have a, you're going to have a pretty immediate reaction to that. All right. So atopic dermatitis is um, eczema. It's a chronic skin disorder that generally begins in early infancy and is characterized by typical distribution, extreme pruritus, chronic collapsing course, and association with asthma and rhinitis. So usually these things occur together. If you have asthma, you have allergies. So if you have eczema, you have food allergies. So they're all pretty much together. Approximately 35 to 40 percent of children who are less than five years old will with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis will be allergic to at least one food. So the doctors that are prescribing these topical steroids, it's masking the problem, but you really should be looking at the diet and what's causing that eczema, what's causing those skin reactions, rather than just what's covered up in the cream. So, um, and typically, like I said, it, it can be a food allergy. These patients typically fail to respond to conventional medical therapy or may have frequent exacerbations of underlying skin disease if causal foods are not strictly avoided. So, like I said, again, instead of avoiding foods, you just cover up with cream, but you should be looking at your diet and maybe trying to eliminate different things that are causing your, your reaction. The food most commonly related to chronic cutaneous symptoms include milk, eggs, peanuts, Soy, which, uh, wheat, fish, and tree nuts. What part, what, what's the part of the fish that causes the allergy? Um, I think it's normally like crustacean. Oh. Like um, shrimp, shellfish, crab. Uh, yeah. So, the most important part of the workshop is you know, I mean, we went over kind of what causes allergies and why they're on the rise or why could they be on the rise, but now I wanted to go into more of what we can do about them naturally to support to support our immune system so we can avoid, like I said, avoid using our inhalers as much if you are asthmatic. Um, so first you want to check for your common deficiencies. There are four that we go over in our office often, and Dr. Mike has his deficient workshop. So a very, four very common deficiencies in Americans are omega-3s, zinc, vitamin D, and iodine. Omega-3s are highly anti-inflammatory. So if you do have allergies or asthma, which is an inflammatory response, and you, you know, you want to definitely make sure you're getting your omega-3s so you can counteract that inflammation. Zinc, we have our, all of these supplements are ones I'm going over. Zinc is also one that's pretty commonly deficient in vitamin D and then iodine. Dr. Mike has an entire workshop on all of these four, so definitely check that out. All right, so you also want to go, we're going to go over these one by one. And these are other things we can do in addition to, you know, looking at these that are commonly deficient. What else can we do to help have some allergies? We'll go over these one by one. So, 70% of the immune system resides in the gut. I kept hearing that and kept hearing that, and I finally was like, I wonder if this is really true. So I, I looked it up, and it's definitely true. I, I found it in um, PubMed, and it said 70% of the immune system resides in the gut, and it's um, extremely important for uh, any kind of allergies or anything coming in. If your gut is healthy, you're, you're able to combat those things and fight those things off. So we have a great probiotic, it's probiophage, and then this is just um, Kim. And anything in parentheses, it's the um, um, referencing research that I found. So she, um, he or she, found um, that probiotics for gut health improve atopic dermatitis. And it is also very important in early, early on. So as infants, you want to start considering, you know, how 
in, in not only not probably not as much in breastfed infants because they're getting the they're getting that the gut floor from their mother or breast milk, but definitely in formula fed infants you want to make sure we consider their gut health. All right, so we want to look at diet. You want to definitely avoid inflammatory foods like sugar and opt for foods that reduce inflammation naturally. <clears throat> and then I found a study on local honey to take <coughs> only for kids above a year because there is um, there is danger of botulism for very kids under a year honey. So it does help with added allergies. <coughs> And then exercise. Exercise is good for everything. So you have a study that said aerobic training reduces bronchial hyperresponsiveness, systemic inflammation, and exacerbations, and improved quality of life in adults with moderate to severe persistent asthma. In addition, we showed that patients with higher inflammation and lower asthma control obtain greater benefits. These findings suggest that adding exercise as an adjunct therapy to pharmacotherapy can improve the main region of asthma. So that was an article from PubMed, so of course they're going to put in there that in addition to the pharma pharmaceuticals, but exercise can definitely help with asthma and allergies. Help with lots of things. So you have, um, we have our methyl donor supplement. <coughs> Uh, asthma and allergies can be associated with undermethylation. Methylation is a um, just a process in your body where you add a carbon and three hydrogens, and it's a it's a biochemical response. And if you under if you're not methylating enough, you can have different issues. And if you're over methylating, then you can have a whole set of other issues. But asthma and allergies falls under the category of undermethylation. Your body is not getting enough nutrients, or so you're not getting the right food. To methylate enough, and so you can have it present as asthma and allergies, and among other things. So this is our methyl donor support supplement. I found a ton of research on quercetin. I listened to YouTube video after YouTube video to make sure I said it right. Quercetin. I think that's it. But I found a lot of research on this. Um, it's got strong antioxidant activity, and it's been shown to improve to support immune health by mediating the release of inflammatory compounds, including leukotriene and prostaglandins. I want to read that whole thing to you, but it, it's really great. It's actually found naturally in a couple different foods, and it's found naturally in things like raspberry and grapes and dark tomatoes and red onions, but it's only going to be, if you eat the food, that's great, but it's only going to give you a, you know, a certain low dose of quercetin in that food. So we have our dehist which has got quercetin in it, and it, it's phenomenal for helping support asthma and allergies. And I wouldn't recommend taking this during an active asthma attack. That's just, this is going to be something that you take over the course of time to help improve your overall inflammation in your body. So it also has, the DHIS also has vitamin C, stinging nettle leaf, bromelain and n acetyl l cysteine So each of these have really, really great properties when it comes to allergies and supporting allergies. Bromelain is found naturally in pineapple, so you can uh, eat pineapple as well. Bromelain is a plant enzyme naturally found on the stem and the fruit of pineapple plant. It's a proteolytic protein digesting enzyme that aids in the breakdown of large protein complexes. Large protein complexes. So um, they included it obviously in this because it does enhance the absorption of quercetin. So DHIS also has steam nettle sleep in it. It's a plant that has been shown to balance immune responses, specifically in the airways and nasal passages. Studies have shown that the extract of steam nettle sleep balances a variety of inflammatory activities that affect respiratory health. Here we have and acetylcysteine is an amino acid precursor, and it's one of the most important antioxidants in the body. And then vitamin C. Very important for uh, its immune boosting properties. And also is included in the 
so. Those are um, just a couple of things that we can do in addition to our chiropractic care to help support asthma and allergies. I'm a chiropractor, so I have to I have to list chiropractic care because there's been studies that have been done that um, have reported chiropractic care as um, a good support for asthma and allergies. This one, these two found that patients under chiropractic care reported um, reduction in inhaler use and improved quality of life. So like I said, you want that's our goal is to help reduce your your need for your rescue inhaler. And then this is a quote I forgot to include from the science paper, which is really neat. It says, abnormal cell and tissue responses to mechanical stress contribute to the etiology and clinical implementation of many important diseases, including asthma, osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, diabetes, stroke, and heart failure. So basically, that's saying if your body is subluxated or if you have poor posture, your your cells and your tissue are going to respond to that, and it's going to be it's going to be an abnormal response. And these these can actually contribute to the etiology, like it says, to the presentation of things like asthma and allergies. So it's really cool. Our body is very interconnected, and your spine, you know, every cell in your body knows what your spine is doing. So that's why chiropractic care is crucial for overall health. And then these were just some case studies that I found that showed improvement in asthma or allergy symptoms with chiropractic care. And there's several more than that, but I just did a quick search and um, found those. Okay, so an action plan for asthma or allergies. First, you want to avoid triggers. You want to do everything you can to support your immune system naturally, but if you know you're allergic to peanuts, definitely avoid those. You don't, you don't want to you want to try it out now. And then second, you want to reduce your toxin exposure. <coughs> Dr. Mike has a workshop called Lifestyle, and it is every room in the house. He goes through room by room and talks about what you can do to detoxify your, your, your house so you can reduce your allergens in your house, and that will help tremendously. Things like you want to make sure you don't have any mold in your house. You want to make sure, um, I mean, if you're allergic to pets, Things like, things like that. All right, and then the next step is going to be to detoxify. And then we have our intracellular detox system there. And that helps basically, it's not a forced, um, it's not a forced detox. It's not going to, it's not going to just detox your entire body. It's, it's teaching your, it's re, it's kind of helping the pathways along that do the detoxification in your body. So it's helping those pathways along so your body can detox itself. And then you have the natural supplements <clears throat> that we listed in addition to the core supplements. So you definitely want to check out what are you deficient and are you taking the, you know, the core supplements and then, then the other ones I mentioned. And then diet changes is extremely important. And then Dr. Mike had mentioned to me that if you to silver and the nebulizer that helps a lot too with um, preventing pneumonia. So you can get the silver and the nebulizer and that'll really help because people with asthma are more prone to it, so you can make sure you use that as an immune support. And then there's the neti pot. Anybody have a neti pot? <laughs> They're interesting. I have one and it, I don't use it very often but it can help irrigate irrigate your sinuses and you know if you have any kind of irritants or dust or anything in there that'll help flush it all out and so it won't keep getting rhinitis because of it. Right. That is it. Anybody have any questions? And you know why the children, why the uh, respiratory allergens seem to present later in their childhood versus earlier? Are you talking about that chart that I had? This is when you knew that kids have asthma when they're young and they outgrow it, not mm -hmm. that they grow into it. They're avoided. Are you talking about that chart that I have? Yeah, I was going to say. Well, what if they're exposed to more and more things? Yeah, in fact, I love them. Oh, they're not sticking out. I 
There you go. It doesn't seem to. Oh, yeah. oh. It's interesting. <laughs> Maybe the longer it goes to uh, pollution, it helps the more, you know, environmental also, factors. They also say that they, after they get past the growth phase, they really don't have any such occurring to the ER. And they said, yeah, they just don't, they don't really see patients coming in. Once they stop growing, once they're grown, they may have <laughs> issues, but they just don't have the ER anymore. Yeah, you do see a lot of times that kids, um, young kids will have food allergies while they're young, and then they do tend to some like that for them. Like you have, you have your kid tested for corn and soy and all of that, and they show up positive, and then the doctor will even tell you, like, they're probably going to outgrow it. So maybe that's another reason why it's skewed with the ages. Do you have a question? Two questions. Sitting out for any sessions? So, do you think that these kinds of supplements, uh, I guess the gut one would especially help, but does it help with food allergies at all? Yeah, it definitely could. There's a there's the people that have proposed that your, I mean, your gut is your immune system, and there's, um, like, as far as celiac goes, you can have those, um, the permeability in your gut can be um, way too much, but your gut can repair. So, I mean, there, it definitely can help to help, to help, to help with your food allergy. Any more questions? I'm over 20 minutes, so. Different flavors. Oh, you can like it. I might so on me because I went so fast. They don't talk for like two hours. I think this is the most interesting part of this to me. Is possible so these so things might be, be like up there. You so said you. Yeah. <laughs> these things might be like too late. Like if you have kids, like and you've already, you know, given them antibiotics while they're young, they might be too late to. But these things are the things that you should go out and tell your friends, the friends that are pregnant, and the you know people that you meet, and tell them, hey, you may have there may be implications in using antibiotics and you know allergies and asthma. And you can point them to the research. I have all the research from. Because um, nobody okay. knows the negative side of the antibiotics, like right. just the general population. Right. Does it, does right. It I'm not. I'm a chiropractor. I'm not a doctor. I would never tell you. I can't tell you not to take medicine. I can't tell you not to take what you're prescribed. But I can help educate you on things you can do differently. You can do in addition. Any Oh, and this was another thing that is, was interesting to me is all of the long-term side effects of taking the corticosteroids. Does that, that include like Flonase and the Rhydocort, the thing? Flonase is a, I'm not, is it an antihistamine or is it a No, it's a steroid. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a steroid. It's a steroid. You don't know. Yeah, you she know. has problems and we actually kind of wean her off there. It's a steroid because you gain weight on it. It's 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 just it's it says quarter, quarter, yeah, yeah it's it's not. not and they're highly prescribed because they work and they work fast. But, but what happens is you have to put more in. Yeah. It doesn't. It never stops. Yeah, that's so we, why. For emergency use, we did have her and then we weaned her off of it because it just wasn't. Yeah. Albuterol, albuterol definitely saves lives. I mean, yeah. If you have something to act about, yeah. it's, yeah. it, it can definitely save your life, but it's not something you want to use. Definitely not every day. And that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's scary, but if you look, I mean, you can, <coughs> you can just quickly type in a Google search. I mean, all of my research is peer reviewed, and I got it off of my feet. I mean, if you just typed in Google, like side effects of long term corticosteroid use, Presses your immune system. Yeah. It just it's not, and especially as soon as she wishes to keep it. I'm gonna go. This is not and a long term plan. Long term plan here. She never. They never mentioned. Oh no, that's something I short term. 
No, it was going to be continuous month once we kind of got our under control. We need to be for ourselves. She has kids with eczema and she hasn't given them topical steroids at all because she pointed out to me the dangers of using topical steroids. You, I mean, they're great because, I mean, they work fast, so doctors prescribe them because you, you can rub it on eczema and it can clear up, but you're not really addressing the cause. You're just masking the symptoms that you really have to look at. She's done a lot of elimination with her kids and she's gotten it mostly under control. So, I mean, you can do a, I didn't want to put pictures up here because it's sad and it's scary looking, but if you Google red skin syndrome, these are people that have um, steroid cream addiction and they, and it's not even like an addiction like, oh, I need the steroid cream. It's like their skin is literally addicted to it. So it's very, very sad. So the <coughs> it's not getting the steroids? Yeah, I think so. I, think so. I have her. Yeah. 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 The doctor told them just use it sparingly. Really, they use it sparingly <laughs> before I knew that. We have um, an increased chance of aseptic necrosis, which is avascular necrosis, like in your hips, your hips especially, because of more of a steroid use. So, definitely a side effect. Any more questions? What is the disease challenge exactly? This, mm -hmm. What is it? What do you do with it? Um, Amber. <laughs> she does so that. So, what you can do with that is take it into a little shot glass and just pour a little bit of it. It's about teaspoons worth. Hold it in your mouth for 30 seconds. So, over that period of 30 seconds, you pay attention to how the taste is developing in your mouth. So, it can be anything from kind of sweet, watery taste to a very strong copper taste in your mouth. So, there's four different scenarios of how it could go. So, if it's sweet and watery, that actually means your body is deficient in it and your body wants more of it, therefore it doesn't taste bad. But if it's a very strong copper taste type thing, then that means that your body probably has enough zinc in it. Thank you. Oh, it's not. Um, right, it helps, you can. It helps, it helps, it helps to determine whether you need to take a zinc supplement. I mean, this is a supplement too. You can okay, take that so every single day, and then once a week you can test yourself just for the heck of it to see how fast your body's getting enough zinc. And um, yeah, we have liquid there, and we have pill form where you can just take a pill a day. But that one. And, you know, you can test whenever you feel like you, you test it. So that is the zinc? That is the zinc, I guess. Yeah, that is it. Okay. Um, I yeah, think it's zinc, the great. same company, but it's the pill. Right. But I did get, she started to take that nasty that. stuff first. <laughs> <laughs> and so you I mean, switch it and it tastes copper. Do you spin it out then? Yeah, it's not going to hurt you. But I wouldn't highly recommend our supplements over just going to Target or Walmart because they are very well researched yes, and so very high quality. quality. I know that if you just get supplement and random vitamins and things from Walmart, ah, you're only ah. getting a small percent actually it's absorbing. It's normally body. synthetic and not, um, and you want a like a whole food supplement type. You want the you want the vitamins to come from real food and not synthesized in the lab. And then they actually had Target recently. I love Target, but Target recently had their, um, they were in trouble because their supplements had fillers and all kinds of stuff. And they were saying this was vitamin whatever, and it, it wasn't at all. They were doing um, independent lab testing on them and they got in trouble. So you have to be very careful. I would rather you spend a little bit more and get, you know, a well-researched brand than spend a couple of dollars and be putting something into your body that's not what it says it is. Or that it's just a filler and you're wasting your money. I've heard that some of the supplements are coming from China. I, I, uh, I'm <laughs> I don't, I don't trust. <laughs> so I, I mean, people, people ask me all the time, "Well, can I just go to Target and get it?" And I'm like, "No, you can't. <laughs> please, please don't." All right.